Uh, nō reira, o kūnei uh, rangatira te tini o ngā whanaunga nō Ngāti Kauna. Tēnei te mihi, uh, mauhā atu ki a koutou katoa ko tāi mai. Uh, ko tāi mai, uh, nei a uh, hau mai te hiku o te eka, uh, me te whare āriki o ngā puhi. Uh, kei te tautoko o tēnei au enei kaupapa kōrero, te kaupapa nunui ko te tāi ao. Um, so, it's, it's lovely to be back here in Kauhinunu, uh, although this place is, uh, has a certain mystique to us of the far north, particularly where I'm from. I'm from uh, Te Heku o Te Eka, Muri Whenua, and um, mai te wā o te taenga mai uh, uh, tamate āriki nui, me tōna tama ko tamate pōkai whenua, uh, ka puta mai te tangata uh, ko ka hunu hunu. Uh, ki te rohi o uh, kaitaia. Um, but this place, the mystique of this place is it's a, it's a place where people from the north go missing. <laughs> <laughs> so Kaununu came, came down here looking for his papa. His papa went missing. But we didn't know where he ended up. And so his tama, Kaununu as we call him, Kahunu Hunu, he, uh, he came down here looking for him. And, uh, well, he didn't go missing. Um, he just got captured. He got captured by Rongo Mai uh, Wahine. Um, and uh, the beauty of the place and the people and the Manaki Tanga showed to him. So, right from the beginnings of time, this place is, uh, well, their time, has captured the hearts of the people of the north. Uh, I'm from a, iwi, a couple of iwi called uh, Uri Tanifa Ngati Hineira. And um, one of our tangata i ngā wao mua ko te tangata rangatira ko Te Wera Hauraki. And Te Wera Hauraki went missing. <laughs> he came down here to accompany Te Whare Umu to bring him home to uh, Mahi because they had been, um, been mates and supporting each other. And so they, he, brought them, he brought them here, he brought them back home to Mahia, except that he never came home. <laughs> and I believe that he passed away here. And uh, we don't know to this day where he is. Perhaps you fellows know. But um, he never came home either. Uh, so there's certainly something about this place that captures, the, uh, captures our people. And not in a bad way, but in a quite a beautiful way. And then... Um, we hear that the roads are closing, closing. so tear up here, <laughs> we might be captured too. <coughs> I'm not that worried about that, that sounds like that, sounds all right. <coughs> I've got my wahine with me, she's uh, one of the mako whanau from out uh, Pakipaki Way. So um, if we get captured, well, that's probably where you'll find us, out <laughs> at the south end of town. Anyway, uh, moving on to, t to, to this time, this is a picture of my dad. Uh, this is my dad here in the 1960s, well there, John Smith. And this fellow next to him is uh, Wirimu Huata. And so way back in the 60s, uh, Te Rangi's uh, papa and my papa used to mahitahi together. And uh, they uh, formulated these groups uh, called He Tō Takitini, uh, where are Ropu Kapahaka or Te Rawa, and they travelled all around the world. This is on some American AWT airlines, and I don't know where they were at this time, but they worked together, uh, my dad and, and we, and so I grew up with um, knowing Ngātai, and um, actually I had a crush on Ngātai. <laughs> See, it's that rungo mai wahine thing, that momo, that momo is coming through again. But um, she was a little bit older than me. Uh, so it was one of those uh, crush at a distance sort of things. <laughs> but she was the young puhi. Uh, she was the young puhi in the kapa haka, uh, the kapa back then. I think she was about 16 or 17. Uh, at, at this time, she didn't get to go on these trips, but uh, we got left behind. So I'm always uh, glad when I see uh, Te Rangi and um, and uh, always um, mindful of the times and the associations our people have had through the generations. You know, my Arnold, with this, uh, this recirculation of relationships. And when uh, I was told that the co-papa of this, uh, this hui was about relationships and, uh, and kotaitanga, 
um, my mind went back to the actual links, not only the historical, but the living links or the recent links uh, in terms of our relationships with you all. Now, yeah, I'll see if I can get this to work. So, um, as our mate Sid, and Sid was a very powerful um, force in our lives when we were young people growing up. And uh, we did a lot of mahi together with Sid over the years and various kaupapa. Because back in those days, tribal boundaries didn't divide us. Um, tribal boundaries didn't get in the way of our kaupapa unity. But we were unified around kaupapa. And it didn't matter ko wide nor here. Ko te mea keironga, ko te kaupapa. And so uh, you can't come to Kahanunu and talk about unity and relationships without uh, paying my respects to, to Sid. And then, of course, um, his Taina uh, Moana and our mate Meriana. And uh, many uh, happy times were spent in the north with these two. And I was really glad to see Meriana at Omahu the other day. And, um, and of course, with Mo, uh, we had close relationships. Once again, ko te kaupapa he, he whakapiri piri a tātou ki a tātou anō. Uh, so, um, Henare Tikani was also part of our movements when we were young in Tungange from up Wairo, and Henare from down this, uh, the south side. And we all worked together as young people when we were young with uh, Kataraina, where are you? You're still here, still here sis? Um, back in the Rangatahi days, we were all young people together. And once again, these are the bonds between us and Kahununu and this living generations. Here's uh, my crush. Te o Ngāti Kahununu. The black cat. <coughs> anyway, um... So I still, I ring up, uh, she doesn't get out much anymore, she tells me, but I ring her up about once every, uh, once a month, and we have these uh, five-hour conversations on the phone where we uh, we talk about all the good times gone by and all the good times happening now and the times to come. So uh, we find uh, feelings towards her. And in more recent times, our sis, uh, Terry Harrison, who is one of the more recent generations of Kahununu activists, uh, who we've done a lot of stuff together with over the years is uh, Otere, who's uh, currently in Waikere, uh, Waikere Puru uh, Hospital, where she suffered a stroke um, about a month ago, so she's in recovery at the moment. So she'd be certain, she's on Facebook. Uh, we uh, send her messages all the time. I'm sure she'd love to hear from, from her relations here too, uh, if you haven't heard from her already. So we certainly tuku aroha to kito tato tuahine ko tere. Anyway, I haven't come here to go down memory lane necessarily. Oh, and finally, our mate Raihania. Raihania Tipuki, no one finally Tipuki, my um, uh, Wairo, but currently living down in Wairo Upper Lake uh, Onoki. And uh, as you'd be aware, uh, Raihania, uh, one of the things he does is he is the kaihotu of the Matawa Maui. And uh, when we were campaigning against the fossil fuel industry, Raihania and, um, and his crew sailed out here to do battle against one of the big uh, oil ships that was coming here to start um, extracting the lower from the Papa Moana off your coast here and managed to chase them off. Beautiful thing to see, this, this uh, beautiful waka uh, haurua uh, chasing off one of these oil barons, sent them packing. And so uh, we stay in contact with Ryan. And so <clears throat> we've got really close relationships and strong relationships and I'd like to just acknowledge uh, Mike Pucky too. Are you still here, Mike? Somewhere? He was here before. Because he's one of the crowers that facilitated the, um, the agreement that the Matawa Maui uh, join us in our, uh, our flotilla that we went out there to challenge. Uh, to challenge. But yeah, uh, so I'm actually here to talk about climate change. <laughs> <laughs> After paying my respects to you all. Um, climate change. So the, as you can see, the world is heating up. And we can clearly feel, feel that now. And as the world gets warmer, it's causing all kinds of chaos in our atmosphere. Something that we've never seen before uh, within the lifetime of humans. And as the oceans warm up, 
uh, it's triggering that age-old raru between Tangaroa and his brother Tafuri. And so warmer oceans drive the winds. And that's why we're getting the cyclonic events coming from the warmest part of the ocean around the equator. Cyclones coming, spinning out down into our part of the world and creating havoc and we're seeing more and more frequent events. Of course, as the atmosphere heats up, it just causes evaporation to happen at a scale that we're not used to seeing. So more and more uh, water getting sucked up into uh, Kapua, and so we're getting these intensive rain events, rivers of rain, like we're experiencing now, causing all sorts of havoc across the, the whenua, uh, causing our awa to uh, overflow. And these are but two of the effects of climate change. Of course, as the atmosphere warms up, things dry out. And so now we're seeing the advent of droughts like we've never seen before. 2019 was a catastrophic drought all the way down the east coast of Taitokiro, right down through here, 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 Tonga, down to the wider upper, uh, these, these massive droughts causing water shortages, uh, stock you know, having to be sent off to the works or off to farmers uh, further down the line. These are some of the effects of uh, sea level rise, the melting of the ice caps, the raising of the moana, and I know that this beautiful shingle bar down here, which separates the moana from the whenua, is your last line of defence before katori mi ai ngā whenua kei rotora ki uta. And I was saying to my kids as we were driving along that beautiful bar along the uh, marine parade, I said, uh, as we were coming from the south, I said, look to the left, you can see all the roofs of the houses, you're actually looking down on the houses because they're quite low. And I said, now look to the right and you can see the moana and it's right up there. Now the only thing that's holding that back there's this beautiful big uh, shingle bank here. And uh, this morning, uh, if you look out the window, we could see that the waves were coming right up to the edge of this building. So it's not going to be too much longer before it actually tops that bar and starts running through to um, the flatlands, Kyuta. And so um, this is clearly observable. We can see this happening. So why is it happening? So climate change is happening because of pollution in the atmosphere. You know, uh, it's our fault. It's our fault, all of our faults. We're driving here, there and everywhere in, in our cars. They're spewing out carbon monoxide. It's going up into the atmosphere and it's clogging up, it's clogging up the, uh, the atmosphere around the earth. And uh, what that's causing to happen is that when the sun's rays come down, um, you know, from the sun, they come down, they hit the earth and then some of them get absor absorbed uh, and warm the earth. Uh, some of them bounce back and reflected back into space. But with all this pollution around, the, around Papatunuku, the, the sun's rays cannot penetrate and can't get back out again. So that's why they call it the greenhouse effect. You might have heard that expression. It's like a greenhouse. These gases are causing a greenhouse, a bubble around the world, and under that greenhouse, things are starting to heat up. So it's the burning of fossil fuels. So fossil fuels... Globally is the major problem. But here in Aotearoa, the second major problem is these fellas here. It's the cows. And the methane that's caused when they eat their kai and what comes out of their guts is a lot of methane. It's a huge amount and it's one of the most damaging gases to the atmosphere. So these are the two major problems. So there's our beautiful Rangi Tuhaha. It's only 10 miles thick from the surface of the earth to the edge. It doesn't go on forever. It's about as thin as an eggshell, relatively. And so it doesn't take too long for that to get filled up full of these gases, you know, over the last couple of hundred years. And increasingly into the future, if we keep pumping the, these gases out, it's really going to clog up and the problem is going to get much worse. So how worse? So here we are here. This is the years, 1990 through to the year 2100, so 100 years. And here we are here, 2020, we're about there. So if you look back, when we first started noticing climate change starting to happen, we started hearing about things like the ice melting in the Antarctic. We started hearing about the Pacific Islands starting to get uh, washed over. Uh, we started hearing about these freak weather events. We started hearing about the massive fires that are happening in Australia because, as I say, when things heat up, they dry out. And when things dry out, they get combustible. They can catch fire. And as we speak, in the northern hemisphere, 
because it's uh, summer in the northern hemisphere, it's winter here. So in the northern hemisphere, Canada's been on fire. 43 million hectares of bush has burnt this summer. And you've got to say that slowly to kind of get the whole full impact of it. 43 million hectares has just burnt wildfires sweeping across Canada, burning everything in its path. We've seen that happen in Australia. We haven't seen that happen at scale yet, but it's probably one of the next greatest climate change uh, threats we're likely to see in the, in the coming years. Uh, we're likely to see, and particularly as all the slashes come down with the floods, you've basically got all this kindling piled up along the coastlines and in the rivers just waiting for, you know, for a spark to set it off. And then it's going to run through. So I'm going to take you on a, this is a speed date to the future. So uh, we haven't got much time, so I'm going to do it real quick. So, um, so in the year 2000s, we were amongst some of the warmest for decades on record. Significant glacier and ice cap melting, a rise in the frequency and severity of national, uh, natural disasters. So we've seen almost unbelievable melting of the snow in the Arctic. Huge areas cracking open, melting, sea levels rising. We know all about that. So into the 2010s, this is the, um, the last decade. Once again, it was the warmest decade on record. So every year the records are broken. They say, oh, this is the warmest ever until next year. And then that's the warmest ever until next year. And this is the way that it's going. We can see the increase and in the records tumbling year after year. Uh, increased uh, frequency and intensity. Oh, and these are the sources underneath. The, I'm not making this up. I didn't get this out of the Weetbix, folks. These, these are the sources. <coughs> uh, significant reduction in sea ice. Uh, increased CO2 absorption by the oceans. So I know we've got uh, one wife and I uh, that uh, got captured by you fellas, uh, uh, Shade. Uh, he's a marine biologist. If you want some more details about ocean acidification, he's your man. And he'll tell you, he'll tell you, I'm sure he'll agree, that the oceans are becoming more acidic. So anything with its fear on the outside, like a coda, a pipi, uh, you know, a, um, a kukatai, um, the acid in the water from the carbon is starting to dissolve their shells. So uh, my, my mates in Tai Rafati are telling me they're already starting to pull up power that are, that are kind of mutating in that. And so there's massive implications on our food systems. If all the little, if all the little things die off, well then the next things down the food chain are going to starve. And that just sets this domino effect. And so all these intricate, uh, intricate balances in our, in our natural world are starting to become disrupted and having knock-on effects. So, I don't know if I can get this thing to work. Maybe not. I'll leave it. Oh, no, catch because we're running out of time. Uh, so here we are, 2020. So the climate change has only just started. We're already starting to see these catastrophic events, even just at the beginning stage. So we've seen things like... Um, you know, Cyclone Bola, Cyclone Hail, oh, not Bola, uh, Cyclone Gabriel, Cyclone Hail, the Auckland anniversary uh, uh, floods. This will now enter the, uh, the record as being another event. States of emergency being declared up and down the coastline, people getting evacuated, all these types of things. So continued sea level rise, changes in climate patterns affecting food production. Now we know that all uh, a lot of the Huarako got knocked out here. Uh, I'm a great fan of Wati's uh, sweet corn, and we can't get any up north because apparently the canneries, there was nothing supplying the canneries here. Wati's still here? Yeah, yeah they're still here, eh? And so, and, and adjust. Yeah, and so we're starting to see the impact on our food supplies. And uh, Dargaville, the Kumara crop got wiped out last year. And Kumara were, were going for $17 a kilo. You know, uh, unbelievable. And so uh, we're seeing these changes starting to affect food production. Uh, increased bleaching events due to warmer sea temperatures. Anybody uh, who's been to Australia might be familiar with the Great Barrier Reef, one of the natural wonders of the world. Well, because the water's warmed up so much over there, all the coral died. And what used to be this rainbow land of colours and fish, Kamatino. And, um, and of course that has a huge impact on fisheries here because 
a lot of our pelagic species they go backwards and forwards across the farm and they and you can't upset the balances you know in this part of the world um, without them having a triggering effect to other areas um, we're starting to see increasing numbers of climate refugees, people that are unable to live in their lands anymore and having to find new places to go. This is going to be an increasing problem uh, for us in the future. So this is the time we live in now. Now going forward into the 2030s, what's that going to look like? Intensified water scarcity in many regions. As the snow melts on our beautiful Paimonga uh, and we, don't, we stop having snow in the Southern Alps, uh, that means that our water security is going to be a problem. There isn't going to be all that beautiful fresh water coming down from our hills, recharging our aquifers. Um, so that's going to be an issue. That's why the farmers are scrambling around at the moment wanting to uh, build things like the Ruatani for them. But they're not building them for you. They're building them for themselves, for the farmers. Because uh, yeah, they, don't want to, they don't want to see their livelihoods threatened. And I get that. Uh, I went out to Menhenika, I went out to Korongata a few years ago and we talked to Fire Mary out at the Korongaril and she was told us about, and while we were there, the water tanks were in the Marae car park and um, the street, the creek out there had gone dry because all the, 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 the wells only went down 20 metres and all those grape growers that, that stuck their wells down uh, much deeper, their rises, and they'd sucked all the water down below and left the whanau's pipes all high and dry. And so there was a, a, a critical water shortage out there. And so uh, these are increased, that's happening now. I don't know if it's happening at the moment, but certainly starting to happen, it's going to increasingly be a problem. So therefore, you know, it may be that um, there needs to be a policy that um, every kind uh, here needs to start thinking about accessing um, funds for a water tank at the bare minimum. And if there's going to be any dams built, and I know Ngahiwi and Ngai are right onto this, they're going to make sure that all your water doesn't get um, gobbled up by, by uh, people that just want to turn the water into money while all you fellows are having to go down with the bucket to the truck. Um, but if there are going to be reservoirs um, that they're dedicated for, for, hum for, for local people's use. Uh, but more importantly, protect the water that's already here. That's the, that, you know, we've got to be able to trust and to restore our own flow of our water. What's the best way to do that? Stop the cows mimming on the land, and uh, and that water running into the uh, into the hour. Yeah. That's that's the major cause of it, and it's all those. We heard already the nutrients that are flowing into the stream from the synthetic fertilisers are causing a massive blooms and algal blooms, toxic algal blooms, and that I forget what you call that weed, Tuhini, alligator weed, that's um, that's causing the coda and the tuna to um, to struggle. And so all of those subsequent problems, all of those nutrients flood out into the, uh, to the moana, then you get those red tides of algal bloom that go up and down. Yeah, I don't know if you've seen them, but uh, that makes the kai moana toxic. And uh, so there's all these spin-off problems and you can trace it all back to 6,000. There's 6,000 dairy units in Aotearoa. 6,000, that's it. And yet they've managed to pollute just about every water source in Aotearoa. And for whose benefit? So if there's 6,000 dairy units, there's probably, let's assume that there's one farming family per unit, that's like 6,000 families get the benefit of all of that at the expense of everybody else. But what's even worse, in my opinion, is that they then, because you know, they, they get themselves into positions of power, regional councils and all that sort of thing, they start saying, well, let's start spending the taxpayers' money to build dams to support us. So they start tapping into your ratepayers' money in order to support their businesses and which cause you harm further down the track. So these are the things I know Baden uh, talked about it, you know, uh, you've got to get um, more influence on, um, uh, on these local body authorities. I'm looking at Ngahiwi there and thinking, oh, he'd just be perfect to be the, 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 the mayor of the uh, regional council. <laughs> too, oh, too old, cut it out. <coughs> anyway, um, so... Intensified water uh, scarcity is coming up in the next decade. Significant biodiversity loss. We're going to see more and more things dying in our natural world. Uh, agricultural challenges uh, and food security. Uh, increased health, uh, health impacts. Now, one of, uh, your, uh, one of your, um, your tangata called Rhys Jones, Tonungua, Dr. Rhys Jones, he's from here. He's, uh, he's a professor. He does a lot of work with us uh, on public health. 
and uh, he talks. Of, he's talked about all the contaminants that have come down in the silt uh, from the rivers, and they're now scattered across the land. Uh, so he's another really, um, really knowledgeable fellow from Kahuna who, who talks about the health impacts. I won't go any more than that. So we're up to 2040 now. Things are moving along. Increased water shortages, potential for now mass extinctions. We'll start seeing mass extinctions rather than just the odd thing falling off. Shane doesn't care. Well, who, who was it that said the other day, or was it Tama? Oh, you know, we're going to lose a frog. Who cares? You know, like it was. You know, I don't know. What I know is that if the bees all die, they're taking us with them. So, so, so we can't. We kind of the Modi is in the smallest things that somebody said, and we are super vulnerable to these things that we may just take for granted, you know. Um, so there's going to be major economic impacts. Round about 2050 to 2060, I think we'll start seeing the global economy start to unravel. There are going to be major environmental shocks. So we've got to make sure that if we're going to make some money in the big capitalist enterprises, um, do it now. And get out quick would be my advice. Diversify out of things like fishing and out of the extractive industries and things like that, because the sun's going to be going down on that stuff. So you know, get out of that and uh, and reinvest in things like um, regenerative farming and alternative uh, food production. I mean, you can still be in the milk business without having having cows. Sounds like a hard case, but these days you go to a cafe. They say, "Would you like milk in your coffee?" You go, "Yeah." And they say, well, would you like oat milk, soy milk, coconut milk? None of those come from cows. So if you want to be in the milk business, mahi at mahi. Just send your cows to the marae, and we'll have a big barbecue with all the farmers. <laughs> <coughs> I said to James Shaw, actually, I said, I could solve this problem with overstocking on uh, farms. And he goes, how would you do that? I said, a few 303s, a bunch of ngāpuis, and some barbecues. <laughs> Anyway, um, so escalating public health crises. Now, this week, there's a huge heat wave sweeping through the Northern Hemisphere. And I was watching on TV uh, early on this week, 500 people died at the Hajj at Mecca, where they go and they walk around that, um, that uh, thing. And uh, 500 people died there, just died of heat wave. <laughs> Same with New Delhi. There's people dying in their hundreds in New Delhi right at the moment. Uh, also in North America, there's a major, what they call a heat dome, over North America. Have a look tonight when you go home on the internet. Look at heat waves around the world and it'll, it'll, it'll tell you what's happening. So we're lucky here. We're not experiencing the full-blown impacts of climate change down here. I think it's our moana saving us. It's soaking up the majority of the heat at the moment. But up in the northern hemisphere, they don't have that luxury because the continents are so big. They're not islands surrounded by ocean like us. But... You know, we've got to look at them because he tau ira mo te wāke te haere. And so we've got to look at that. So, um, where are we? Where are we up to? 2050, 60. Oh, we've already been there. We're going backwards. Up to 200, oh, 2000. So by the 2060s, Many of the impacts are going to become uh, irreversible. And I just want to demonstrate something else. Oh, here we go. Have you guys heard of the tipping points? Yeah. Climate tipping points? I just. You'll know what these are. You've ever been in school and sitting under a chair and rocking your chair there? So when you get to a certain point. So that's the tipping point. So we can cause damage up to a certain point and everything's okay. And then we cross this line where we can't stop it. And that's what they call the tipping point. And once you get to that point, we can't stop it. We can't reverse what's happening. And so um, many impacts become irreversible. We'll be experiencing severe coastal flooding by then. And uh, it's, it's been estimated that a quarter of a million people will have to be resettled from the coastline. Most of Napier by that stage. All the way through to Waipatu. We've done some modelling. But all the, all the housing here, that big lepo that, that was your food basket in Ngāwāo Mua, will, will come back. You'll have a beautiful big 
swamp lands out here again. Uh, but so lots of people are going to have to move by 2060. There's going to be increased reliance on technological adaptations. Like, for example, I'm thinking about things like uh, air conditioners. Like, if you don't have an air conditioner, you're going to be pretty uncomfortable in your house. Temperatures are going to be up. I mean, they're starting to hit 50 degrees in a lot of places now around the world. 50 degrees is on the edge of what humans can tolerate. Past 50 degrees, you start dying in numbers. And we're already getting up there now. Summers here are getting, been getting pretty close to 40. Has, has it hit 40 here last summer? Did it hit 40? Not yet. Yeah. Some places have here. I forget where now. But so uh, if you don't have money, if you don't have money to have all this technology, oh, sorry about this, folks. Uh, if you don't have money to rely on technological adaptations, uh, people who, who are poor harder are going to suffer more. Uh, near total loss of the summer Arctic sea ice, totally melted. Uh, that's going to probably raise the sea level um, by one, maybe two metres. That'll mean that it's up to the top of this bank and when the storm surges come, they'll be running into town and beyond. So where are we up to now? 2070, massive di displacement of populations. People all around the world. Bangladesh is a real worry area. There's 30 million people live on the, the delta of the Ganges River. And it's about this high above sea level. A lot, a lot of places live on stilts. When they go under, there's going to be 30 million people looking for somewhere to go. And their neighbours don't like them. They're, not, they're going to be building walls and telling them, tough. Uh, the Philippines, which is in our neighbourhood. Millions of people in the Philippines. Whole lot of islands strung out above the north of Australia. Where are they going to go? There's going to be the emergence of new ecosystems. So it's going to go from being, you know, um, and already I was talking to Ngahi a while back and he says, we're already starting to see the people from Tauranga and Bay of Plenty, it's too hot for kiwi fruit. You need a frost to set the fruit. And Ngahi was telling me last year that they're coming down here and wanting to bring their operations down here. Uh, and so, I mean, that might have advantages uh, but it could also have disadvantages. But what's going to happen is that these new ecosystems are going to emerge uh, and cause disruptions in the current uh, activities that are going on. So where are we? Up to the 2080s? What does it look like then? Uh, where? Uh, Australia. Yeah. Yeah. Extreme and prolonged heat waves. Almost constant. So there won't be seasons anymore by then. I've noticed now even, you know, um, the trees don't know uh, when it's autumn because it doesn't get cold. And uh, up home, like my tomatoes the last winter didn't die. We had a thing in my tomato and uh, my strawberries. They grew all year because they didn't get that cold snap to tell them time to go to sleep. They just kept going. Uh, our manuka, our kanuka was flowering all years, all year. Great for, the, uh, great for the bees, but what does that do to the trees when they, they don't know whether or not they should be asleep or awake and it starts interfering with their own rhythms? Um, there's going to be uh, frequent failures of critical infrastructure, and we already heard from, uh, I think uh, Baden might have talked about that, about uh, how you know, all the work that gets done on the roads and the bridges, and, and we spend millions of dollars that could be going into better things, and we build it all back up, Naka Eminiti, Hingano. Another big storm rolls in, smashes it all over, we're back again. So critical infrastructure is continuously being, um, being hammered. Uh, getting up towards the end of the century, many regions uh, reached or surpassed ability thresholds. You can't, there'll be some people, places you can't live anymore. I'm worried about Taitukuro, it's the hottest part of our country where I'm from. And it's already unbearable now in the summer. You know, um, a lot of us struggle to even go outside and work outside for more than two hours. Two hours in that heat and you just, you just gone. And so um, increased dependency on technological interventions, once again. Uh, global cooperation, unprecedented global cooperation. So that's when the world will wake up and start trying to do something about it. 
And it's not happening now, and it'll be too late. In my opinion. Okay, this is not a good story. But it's, you know, we need to know. We need to have the know, you know, not delude ourselves that this is what's coming. So, 2100 and beyond, uh, long term adaptation essential for survival and ecosystem resilience. So we're going to be in survival mode by about then. There's also the potentiality for the legacy of change. So if we have early interventions now that have influenced the climate trajectory, we can change that future if we do stuff now. What do we do? Instead of that relentless climbing up We've got to flatten this curve right out. And we've got to keep those temperatures down to, uh, well, even these are going to be difficult to manage. The one that we were seeing before is unmanageable. We can still manage it to a certain degree if we keep the temperatures down. But even uh, the current policies, are still, we're still going to hit 2.8 uh, degrees thereabouts. We need to do better than that. We need to... Uh, oops. We need to do this. We need to collapse emissions and have radical change now, within the next five years. So this means the business as usual approach, like everything can go on ake tonuatu, we've got to just get it through our heads that that's not viable. And I know it's hard, it's, it's a hard thing to, I mean, I struggle to get my head around it sometimes. Um, but we've got to take immediate action and we've got to pull um, the emissions down. And there's two ways of doing that. One of them is we've got to immediately lower the national herd, and that'll take the pressure off our rivers and our natural environment. We're going to do that. And the second thing that we need to do is we need to address our transport, uh, and we need to start um, collectivising our transport. Uh, free transport everywhere. Free buses to Auckland, free train rides to everywhere. Uh, free scooters, free Ubers, free um, self-driving cars, make it free. Just imagine how, mon how much money you could save if you, didn't have to, if you didn't have to pay for fuel, you didn't have to buy a car, and you didn't have to service it. You know, your material um, yearly income would probably, I don't know, double. You'd have that much more money around. We've just got to build systems that are not based on individuals all driving around by themselves in the car in a big long line of individuals all sitting there, lonely fellas in their car. And we've just got to, I don't know, we had, I used to have a train that we used to go from up and down to Taitokero. And it was the most fun thing that you could ever do was get on the train and go down to the city with your whanonga. The guitars would be out, they'd be sly grogging it down the end cart There'd be romances made and, and lost and won. And, um, and so I think we've got to turn our, our public transport into something that's fun, that's enjoyable, uh, that uh, we've got to get our young people away, away from the idea. When I was young, our major ambition was to buy a V8 and drive to Wellington for a hamburger <laughs> from Kai Tire. That was the run. That was your come of age as a young man. Yep, we're going to Wellington. What for? Hamburger. <laughs> and our V8. Of course, we were going to stop at every pub on the way. But, um, but you know, we just got to get out of that way of thinking. And thankfully, the young people, I don't think there's many young people want to do that anymore. I'm on a bike now, and I'm nearly 70. And I've seen these young kids, they've got these things called siren bikes. You know, they steal those tannoy speakers from the schools. They tie them to the bars, and they wire them up to their uncle's battery. And then they play this rinky-dink music as they drive around the streets, ding 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 ding, ding like this. Well, I'm thinking about patching up with them. <laughs> no, seriously. <clears throat> I think the government should, sub you know, they had a subsidy uh, that said that they'd pay $8,000 to go towards an electric car. Well, for eight, and you had to pay the other 60000 but you, you give them all the rangatahi and down our way $8,000 and they'd get a $4,000 bike and they would probably get a $4,000 sound system and stop pinching the speakers off the schools. 
so these are some of the solutions that I think are actually practical and that young people would like. And I'd be right up there with them, I'd join them. And, uh, and so, so why isn't all this happening? Why isn't it happening? What's happening at the moment? So what's happening at the moment is that this government is probably the greatest threat to Māori in regards to climate change. It's, you know, we can talk about the weather, we can talk about the cows, we can talk about the cars, but the greatest threat to us right at the moment is this Kore Take government, who has not, instead of doing all the things that we're suggesting here, they're doing the opposite. So instead of cutting back on fossil fuels, they're opening up our Taku Tai Moana to the big oil companies to come back again. Instead of um, bringing the dairy farmers into the ETS scheme, they're saying, oh no, we'll let you off. Instead of cutting back on the fertiliser, they're saying to Balance and all those other, those other ones, I mean, I've got a good mind to go down and camp up down the, the end of the beach here and, and uh, make myself a real nuisance at your fertiliser plant. <laughs> because, um, you know, you've got some awesome targets. You've got some awesome targets here. <laughs> and so, yeah, yeah, because, you know, if... I mean, I was listening to the work that's been done studying the Modi of our hour, and that's beautiful work. But at some point, when you kind of, um, uh, you know, and I'm not here to tohu tohu anybody into what, what you know, I, I, I believe in that work and I'm really supportive of it. But from what, where I think, I think it's okay, so we know now that the river's puri, right? Cool. Now what are we going to do? Yeah. And that's the bit that we need to, we need to take that next step. And that next step is shutting down fertiliser. That's the next step. And that's going to stop... See, without the fertiliser, you can't grow all the grass for the millions of cows. Now, the government's decided they want to double production of our farms in the next 10 years. That, that means not only are they going to keep the amount of cows that are here now, they want to double them. Now, the only way they'll do that is two things. More water and more fertiliser because they've got to have the grass. That's why they're spending your money on building dams for half a dozen cow cockies. That's why they're subsidising fertiliser, because the land itself naturally can't grow with enough grass. So you've got to have mutant grass that they're just pumping full. It's like methamphetamine. It's like crack for grass. They're just pumping it up in order to feed these cows that are going to kill your hour. Now, come on. You know, I'm not the smartest uh, light bulb on the Christmas tree, but even I know that's wrong. You know, so, so that's where we need to go. Transport and transforming the agricultural industry. Now, I'm even prepared to help them because, uh, you know, and uh, it takes a lot for me. That I've got to eat a few dead rats before I want to go help, help these buggers. But, I mean, we so desperately need to change that I'd say to them, look, what do you fellas need? I'll go, I'll go hassle the government and say, give these cocky some money to start the transformation. Support them, incentivise it. You know, give them a carrot and we'll bring the stick. You know, we need to incentivise them so that they, have, they, they, are, they, are, they see something in it for them and there's got to be some compliance and enforcement to say if you don't do the right thing, you're going to get higher taxes, you know, you're going to get none of the breaks that you farmers are used to getting. But I think we should support our farming communities too. And if they want to get off the land, well then, government should buy them out and whakahoki o mai te whenua ki te hunga kainga. You know, because we saw uh, in Tina's uh, picture of the, a beautiful picture of the awa, and where all the native wāku ngāhere was, everything was kei And I know that uh, we're part of that taio. You know, they say in Wanganui, ko o te awa, ko te awa, ko o. Well, I think we all got to say, ko o te taio, ko te taio, ko o. And if we've got a healthy taio, we're going to be healthy. Anyway, ka nui mo tēnei wa. I'd like to, this is a hard kaupapa to try and unpack in the half an hour. And I'm sure I've gone over the half an hour. <laughs> Thank you. But um, we probably need to come, we'd like to come back sometime and start talking about the adaptation strategies that we've developed. We've developed a, quite a comprehensive um, set of um, pathways to, to help whānau and 
This is not targeted at the iwi, but it's targeted at the whānau level. See, at the moment, the iwi is getting hurt, but there's individual whānau getting smashed at the moment. Their houses, their place, their businesses. So we've got to make people resilient at the whānau level. And so we've got some strategies to, to, to look at doing that. Anyway, um, I really want to um, say once again, just in closing, uh, what a pleasure it is to be here amongst you again. Uh, I don't know you all, um, but I kind of know something about your ahuatanga here in Ngāti Kahununu. And I know that my tūpuna, right down to my dad and my family, including my missus, loves you people. And so oh, that's me too, I'm in. Kia ora tātou. <laughs>